Jane, can you open this for me? I'm just going to assume I'm Oh, locked. never mind. I got it, Jane. June. I got it. Miss. Hey, Jane, you can watch. I think we're live. So hopefully somebody will type in the thing. I didn't see the little blue bar today. So I'm just going to assume we are and say, hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I'm a little concerned that we're not live, but I, yes, we are. Very good. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Lisa. Chaksameh to you, too. So today is Passover, and if you celebrate, happy Passover. We are going to do a Passover show. We have two extraordinary whole food plant-based vegan chefs that are not only going to do a Passover menu, but they do it completely SOS-free. That means without sugar, oil, or salt. First, we're going to have up Shada Soleimani from Healthy Cooking with Shada. We're going to be making a sweet potato kugel and her grandmother's haroset. And then we have Chef Carol Levy, who is going to be making gefilte fish, not really fish, with a beet horseradish and matzo ball soup. It can't get any more traditional than that. You ask, why do we do the shows on the holiday? So then you guys don't have time to get the recipes and make them because this way the chefs can actually eat them, enjoy them tonight when they have their Seder. So first up is the person that gave me this beautiful shirt for my birthday, my dear friend, Shada Soleimani. Thanks so much for doing this. I know it's a holiday, I know it's a lot of work, but I hope that at least it made it easier for you tonight to not have to cook. It did. Hi, AJ. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And yes, tonight I am going to take the sweet potato kugel that I'm making here, and I'm going to take the haru set over to my aunt's house. So we will be enjoying this tonight at our Seder table. Absolutely. Great. So your grandmother's haru set, how is that different than anybody else's haru set? Well, depending if you're, if you're Ashkenazi or Sephardic, we all have different ways of making it. There is no right way or wrong way of making the haru set. But growing up, this is exactly how my grandmother made it. And I remember, you know, as she was getting older, I, thought, I kept telling myself, I have to learn how she makes this because none of us in the family knew how she made the haro set. So I asked her, I said, Grandma, can you teach me how to make it? And she taught me how to make it. And I'm so glad I learned from her because this is a tradition, a family recipe that I can, you know, we can just pass down to my cousins and their children and, and their children's children. Her haro set was really, really delicious. Now it's rich. It is not something to be, you know, it's, it's, it's all based on if you're eating calorie density or trying to lose weight, this is not that food. This is literally for the service itself when you're putting it on the matzah and you're putting it on the romaine lettuce and you're, you know, you're going through the service itself. So it is calorie dense. It is not favorable to weight loss, but I'm telling you, we only have this once a year and it is absolutely delicious. And I've always looked forward to my grandmother's. And I, the only thing I changed in my grandmother's Haro set recipe is because I'm allergic to walnuts. I took the walnuts out and I replaced it with cashews. That's the only difference. Otherwise, this is completely her recipe, not mine. I didn't do anything to it. In case somebody isn't familiar with the holiday of Passover or the tradition, what is, you say haroset, some people say haroses, <laughs> what is it? Well, uh, we actually call it halif, and I, I had no idea what the English English name was, and I had to go ask around because I've always grown up and I called it halif, and this is what we, this is what, you know, in the Persian community, um, this is what we call it. But the, but the, but the haroset is to represent that, Back in the days of the Israelites, when you know we were, in, you know, the slaves, and it's the it's the brick mortar that that they used to to lay the bricks in. It was the mortar, so that's to represent all the hard work of, of the Israelites. And the sweetness is for the sweetness of freedom when we were finally free and we were on our way. So it's got a very um, it's got a definite meaning and tradition behind the haroset. So. Um, I did a YouTube video uh, teaching how to make a haro set in the Kugel. And in there, I had to put it also in Farsi because like I said, a lot of us know it as halef and not haro set. So now I've got, I, I put both of those in. So, yeah. Nice. Well, I can't wait to see your version or your grandmother's version. Now, did you ever used to make it, AJ? 
I never made it, but every year I would eat it and love it and say, why do we only eat this once a year? It's so good. And then the next year would be like, it's like eggnog. It's one of those things that's delicious, but if it's not attached to a holiday, you forget about it. I'm not crazy about the fact that they always put wine in it though. Cause I'm very, you know, I, that's what I didn't like. Very sensitive to alcohol, but I loved it. I mean, it's apples and sometimes raisins and, and walnuts and, and cinnamon. What could be bad and that's really true i did a twist um not long ago i did a youtube video and i did a twist on my grandmother's harrows and i called it you know a twist on grandma's harrows and i made them into like bite-sized like little truffles right and the reason i did that is because this recipe does call for manischewitz so this does have pomegranate juice and manischewitz but the other one that i did and i took a twist off of my grandmother's that one has no alcohol and it's literally just pomegranate juice. So there, there is two versions of this Haro set that you can make. But like I said, the other one is more of little bite size that each person can have a little bite size on, the, on their plate and not have to worry about eating a lot of it. So they can also refer to my uh, webpage, website and find that recipe if they're interested. Great, thank you. And do you use any special apple? Uh, does it matter? I am sorry, I didn't hear you. Is it, does it matter what apple you use? Is, 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 are certain apples more favorable for this dish? Um, I, I'm partial, we were partial to green apples, but this morning it's so funny because I thought I had a green apple because the Haro set has a um, green apple and a pear. And I looked in the fridge and we had no um, green apple. So I am actually using like a baby gala apple. I don't think it matters. I think it just depends on what you want to use. The, um, because there's so much raisins and dates in this recipe, it is more on the sweet side. So if you wanted to use a Granny Smith, you're completely fine. So whatever apple you have, just use it. It, it really, it doesn't matter all that much. Terrific, terrific. So shall we get started? Get started, yep. All right, so we're gonna get started on the sweet potato kugel. And if you're, um, I don't know if you've posted the recipe or not, but well, it's- I, I have a little bit of a problem. I'm trying to post all your recipes, but see YouTube limits me to 5,000 characters. And when I put both of your recipes together, it's 10,000. So can I tell people maybe to get on your mailing list to get these recipes? Absolutely, have them get on my mailing list. They can also go to my website. The recipes are on my website. The YouTube videos are up for both of these recipes. So there's plenty of places where they can access um, the recipes. So they don't have to sit there and jot everything down right now because I'm just, I know we don't have a lot of time and, and I know Carol's got a lot of re wonderful recipes that she's gonna be doing. So we're gonna try to move this along a little bit. So. Um, what I've already done is this, this is literally all sweet potatoes in here. So I've got like about five to six small to medium sweet potatoes that have been grated in the food processor. And then I've got about three um, apples that have been grated and it's already mixed together. So I went ahead and did that ahead of time. And it looks like a lot, but it's not. It's going to actually fit in my 13 by nine silicone pan dish, which will be great. And the oven, we've already turned that on, so that's ready to go. So make sure you wear gloves for this because this is all about getting your hands in there and really, really just getting in there and working with the food. Um, you could probably do it with a spoon as a, probably there's people that don't wanna get in with their hands, but I don't think there's anything better than putting your gloves on and just getting in there and massaging it and making sure that everything is moved do you like working? You like working with your hands. I know I you do. It. I think you got to get all that love in the food, like when you massage kale. Exactly. So the other thing that I'm going to be putting in here is barberries. Now, barberries, we use a lot of this in Persian cooking. Um, we make it, we use it for a lot of stuff. Now, if you don't have barberries, barberries, um, they're high in antioxidants. They're really good for you. Dr. Gregor even talks about it in his book, uh, How Not to Die. And um, if you can't find it, go to my Amazon page and it's in there. Or if you go to any Middle Eastern stores, they typically have um, the barberries. Now the barberries, you do want to soak them and for maybe about 10 minutes, no, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're going to put the barberries in here. And I like it because it adds a little bit of a red color to this dish. Now, if you don't want to use barberries and you want to use raisins instead, by all means, I don't think there's any right or wrong. I know I had someone 
telling me that, you know, I forgot the raisins in this kugel. Well, this was my version of how I wanted to make it. And, you know, if you guys want to add raisins, by all means, add raisins. Um, this is the beauty about cooking this way is that way you can add whatever things that you like. The other thing I'm going to add to this, because this is more of a dessert type of dish, because when I made it and took it to some friends, they're like, oh my God, this was a wonderful dessert. Um, so it's more on the dessert side. I am going to add um, dried mango to this. And I know it's not in the recipe, but I had some leftovers and I decided to add it in here is dried apricot. So we're going to add that in here. And as you're adding things in here, go ahead and keep mixing it so that it really gets um, incorporated. So that's as far as what our sweet is going to be. In. So remember, we've got apples, dried mango, and uh, dried apricot, and we do have some barberries in here. So let me, it, it, you need a towel or something because you constantly are going to have to clean your hands. Now, as far as the spices that we're going to put in here, we are going to add cinnamon. And who doesn't love cinnamon? Let's add some cinnamon in here. And then we're going to add some nutmeg. Where's my nut? Oh, there's my nutmeg. Let's see. We're going to add nutmeg in here. We're going to add some ginger. I love using ginger. AJ, do you use ginger in your food? I do. I like ginger. I think it adds a lot of health benefits also to add the ginger in here. So let's add the ginger. And then um, something that we use in Middle Eastern cooking a lot is cardamom. So we are going to add cardamom to this. We actually put cardamom in our tea. I don't know if you've ever had tea with cardamom in it. Have you? Have you ever had that at our house? Yes, I had tea with cinnamon and cardamom. It's very good. Sharon McRae had some at her house once and it was delicious. Hey, uh, Shada, Lauren wants to know if you ever made matzah kugel. I haven't used, okay, so here's the thing. I'm not a huge fan of matzah. Like literally, thank God it's only once a year. And like the first night we eat a little bit of matzah. Um, but no, I have not made matzah kugel. So now that the spices are in here, I want you to go ahead and mix this really well because you want to make sure that it gets all incorporated. You know what? There's so many different variations on making kugel that that's why I think there's really no right or wrong way of making it. Did you ever make kugel? I actually have not. <laughs> but you're Ashkenazi, right? No, I just never made, you know, I never got this whole thing. Of, you know, I, I just eat what the day is. Like, I don't worry about like that it's a certain holiday. You got to have a certain food or your birth. You know, I just eat food. I, I never was really that, you know, specific about that. Well, so you, okay. So you were just really not that observant, basically. Not observant of any holiday, really. I, I, yes, that is correct. I mean, I would go to people's houses when invited and stuff. And it always drove me crazy because it was like three hours reading the Haggadah and I would be starving. I know, I know. That does take, that does take a long time. But I was brought up Sephardic, which I'm very grateful because my food during Passover doesn't really change. So it basically stays the same. My friends that are Ashkenazi, on the other hand, no, their food changes. And I always tell them, well, just become Sephardic for this one, one week. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, so that's why I have a lot of people uh, ask me, what am I really going to eat this week? And if it's anything's going to change it, I'm like, nothing changes for me. Um, I basically still eat the same thing that I eat during the week, which is, you know, what you eat during the week. So now we're going to add some chickpea flour. Now I know um, the Ashkenazis probably are not going to want to add chickpea flour to this, but so you can add matzo meal to this. 
And that's one of the differences um, from being Sephardic and Ashkenazi. Because we eat legumes and we eat rice. So, which is nice. So we're going to add chickpea flour. And again, try to mix this. And then we're gonna add our liquid to this. And our liquid that we're going to add to this is apple juice. Now, one time I did not have apple juice and I actually made this with pomegranate juice and it turned out really well. So if you wanna use Pomegranate juice, apple juice, pineapple juice, mango juice, um, whatever juice you like, go for it. Um, it all comes out really, really delicious. So let's add our apple juice to this. Now you really want to get this in mixed really well. Now you see why I wear gloves? Yeah. People are always asking me on my show, why do I always wear gloves? Well, this is the reason why. I don't want to get in there with my hands. I thought it was because you're a Virgo. Well, that too. And plus, I don't want to ruin my manicure either. <laughs> I got my first manicure after a year. They opened up. They've got the things and so so fun to have nails again oh yeah do you get the gel or do you just get that regular polish ever chen told me about this thing called powder and so i i got that and it supposedly lasts for a month and it doesn't chip and it always stays shiny and beautiful yeah that's like a i like that actually i've done the powder that's better than the gel yeah that's nice to do Okay, once this is completely mixed. Oh, the other thing I forgot to tell you is when you're shredding or grating your potatoes, if you see that it's really watery, go ahead and squeeze the water out of it. I was using Hannah sweet potatoes. And for some reason it wasn't, I don't know if you noticed this AJ or not, but when I'm grating it in the food processor, it doesn't come as watery as when I grate it by hand. Do you I, find that? I think so too. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, so this is ready. Let me move this. And we're gonna just put all of this. Put this in here. And if you don't have a silicone uh, dish, I really recommend getting it because it really does make your life easier. See, I think you could eat this kugel all year round. It doesn't have to be just for the holidays. I think we can eat any of these foods that we only eat once a year all year round. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I personally would not eat the Haro set all year round. I wonder if there'd be a way to make it without the nuts that would be, that would be as good. Um, like I said, I made it uh, for those bites, but it's got almond meal in there and it's got two nuts instead of the four. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. I, I think once a year, it's more than plenty. And... <clears throat> I don't know about you, but sometimes when you eat something too many times, it's not your favorite anymore. You know what I mean? But I never get sick of sweet potatoes for some reason. Well, that's different. Sweet potatoes is just sweet potatoes. Now what you want to do is pack this in really well. You want to make sure that it's evenly packed in because you don't want to have lumps in the middle of it. That's not going to be good. So just take your hand, the back of your hand, or take your palm and just press it down. And we're gonna put this in the oven. The oven's already on.
Do you have any questions or anything? Let me see. Let me look in the chat. I was actually, I, I've been struggling all this time to try to get the recipes in the show notes, but I could only get two out of the five. So thankfully you ladies have it on the, uh, on your website. Um, uh, yeah, Ginny, the, re the Kogel recipe is on her website. Oh wait, is the Kogel recipe on your website? Yes. Yeah. I just checked it. Yes, it is there. So go to Healthy Cooking with Shada. I saw it there. And uh, da, 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 let's see if there's any other questions. <laughs> Uh, potatoes, uh, Caroline was saying, if you were gluten-free, you could use potato starch. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So Lola says, so you're saying you can eat rice during Passover. I think it just depends where you were, where, you know, how, you know, different, there's different factions of Judaism from reformed, conservative to orthodox, and there's, there's not, exactly. not one rule for every, it's a, it's like a one size fits most, not a one size fits all. And that's why I'm glad that I can have rice, I can have beans, I can have, I can have it all. There's no, and that's why I say there is no restriction. All right, I'm gonna take these gloves off so I can put this in the oven. So this is going to go in the oven. For about, oh, I gotta move the table so I can get this in. But this is gonna go in the oven for about 40 minutes. And let's set the timer. And I just want to show you the finished product. This is the finished product of the Kugel. I made it last night um, and what's on top. So what's going to happen, I'm going to show you what, how I make the topping. So the topping is pecans, and slivered almonds, which is right here. So you are going to take your slivered almonds, put it in a cup, and then you're gonna take your slivered pecans, and then you're going to mix the two. Charlene, if you go to the show notes, you'll see both these ladies' websites listed. I, I checked, it's right there. And Lola says she'd love to have a great vegan knedlach recipe. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> what is that? It's a, it's a I, I, I don't know exactly, but I know it's a Jewish food for sure. Anything that ends up is a, oh. it is. Oh, that I agree. And then you're going to take, um, I buy this from Date Lady and it's uh, date syrup. And you're gonna take some date syrup and you're gonna pour it in here. And then you are going to mix this too. So what this is going to do is this is gonna become the topping that's gonna to go on top of our kugel because after 40 minutes of the kugel cooking, you're gonna take it out and then you're gonna to top it with this and then you're gonna put it back in the oven and you're gonna cook it for another 15 to 20 minutes. Just make sure that the almonds are not going to burn. And this just gives it, oh my God, it makes it taste so good. So this is why I say, and now if you don't wanna add this extra part to it, you don't have to, but it just makes it so much delicious. Um, you're familiar with halva, right? What's it called? Halva. Halva? Yeah, so there's many ways. Made of tahini, yeah, it's like candy made out of sesame seeds. Right, so there's many ways of making halva. And when I made this combination, it, again, it reminded me um, when, grandma used to, when grandma used to make halva. For whatever reason, this, this combination and having it toasted in the oven, Oh my God, it made it taste so good. So we're gonna set this aside because this is pretty much ready. And this is gonna go on top of the kugel when our 40 minutes is up. But if we don't have time that I show you how to do that, again, like I said, here's the, here's the finished product of the kugel with the topping on top and it is absolutely delicious. So we will be taking this, um, to my Aunt Giti's house, which you know Aunt Giti very well, but that's what we're going to do. 
Oh my God, that, I bet that could even almost be dessert. Well, that's what I mean. Um, do you remember my friend Adela? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had neighbor Ed take this a piece to Adela to her house because he was going over there. And she texted me back and she goes, oh my God, thank you so much for this great dessert. And I started laughing because it's not really dessert, but this Google definitely um, can be considered a, a dessert. So, so yes. Well, to you and me, apples and uh, sweet potato is dessert. I've always loved sweet potatoes. So, all right, so let's get started on grandma's paro set. Well, that is cooking. So you will need um, a food processor for this. And grandma, what she used to do is she used to back in Iran and even here in the United States, she used to buy all her nuts raw and then she would toast it herself. And I tell you, when you toast it yourself, the house just smells incredible. It, and the, the, the taste, it's so much better than when you buy it already pre-roasted. Cause you know, when you, you don't know what, what else they may be adding to it. So that's exactly what I did. And her recipe calls for almonds, pistachios, hazelnuts, and again, walnuts, but because of my allergy and I am taking this to my aunt's house tonight, there's no walnuts in this house. And I, I went ahead and bought um, cashews instead and the taste is still there. So I did um, you know, toast these myself. I actually did it in the Breville, which made it even that much easier. Poor grandma, she used to do it on, you know, over the stove top, which took longer. So we're gonna pour this in here. Now you're going to pulse this because you don't want it, you wanna make it into a powder and you don't wanna make it so fine that it becomes a paste. So you wanna be careful. And having a little bit of um, small, tiny chunks is there is not a bad thing. It just makes your haroset even taste better. So. Right. So now we're gonna take it out. And we're going to put it in a bowl. Now there's going to be some chunks in here that are not really grind, but it's, you want it into a fine, fine powder. And if there's some big pieces in there, well, so be it. It's okay. Nothing, it's, nothing's going to happen. Now we're going to take, um, oh, now we're going to take the apples and the pears and we're gonna put all that in here. Let me take it out. So we're gonna take the apples, you wanna cut them. And you want to cut them into somewhat thick chunks. You don't have to make it into small, small chunks at all. You know, put that in the food processor. But like I said, I didn't have the, the bigger green apples, so I'm going to use two small. These are gala. Actually, I think they're pink lady. So either one's going to work. Now we're going to add the pear in here. And I'm using a Bartlett pear. You wanna make sure that it's right. So. You ever have one of those Asian pears that are half apple, half pear? I love those because they're, they're not mushy like pears get and they're yeah. crispy and juicy. They taste really good. They do, they taste really good. And you can, you know, if you don't, um, Whatever pear you want to use it because there's so many different types of pears. Just add that. So once you got this in here. All 
All right, what else are we gonna add? We're gonna add the raisins. Now, um, we use two different types of raisins uh, when we're making the haro set. If you go to the Middle Eastern markets, they have, I don't, and I don't know if you've seen them, they have these green, green raisins. Um, Is that different than yellow raisins? Yeah, it's, it's got more of a tart flavor to this. Um, so we'll use that instead. I know Laurel Paley was asking me if she could use the yellow raisins and I said she probably could. There's no right or wrong. Um, but if she goes to the Middle Eastern store, she can find the green raisins. And we're also using red raisins. So we're gonna put that in here. And by the way, you guys, this actually makes a lot. So if you wanna cut the recipe in half, um, you definitely can. And then we're also going to add, where did I put my dates? Oh, here we go. We're going to add dates in here. And make sure that your dates are somewhat soft. If they're not soft, then go ahead and soak them like 15 to 20 minutes in water and then you can disregard the water and then you can use your dates. But these dates that I got from Costco, they're fairly, um, they're pretty ripe, which is kind of nice. Okay, now we're going to blend this until everything is well incorporated. So this will have, like when you make that, when you make this, it'll have, you can feel little bites under your, you know, under your teeth of the, the little bit of the raisins, the, the, um, the nuts, the dates, the apples. Oh, this is already starting to come together. I'm gonna blend it just a little bit more. Now we're going to add the date mixture to the nuts. Have you ever made simis? No, and I don't even know what that is. That was my favorite holiday. Di well, I, I think it had meat in it when my mom made it. I was little, but it was, it, it had carrots. It had parsnips. I think it had sweet potatoes. It was really good. I think simis in Yiddish means a big deal. And it was like a big deal to make. That's why we didn't have it very often. But I do remember liking that quite a bit. When, when we did ours, we ate a lot of the Middle Eastern, like we ate a lot of Persian food, you know, for the Seder even. Um, so some of this, some of the stuff like what you know the Ashkenazis eat is like new to me. So I don't even, you know. All right, so we're gonna put that in here. And next, we are going to add. Oh, let's add our spices before we do that. We're going to add coriander to this. So we got about a quarter teaspoon. You know, it's funny, somebody messaged me and says, are you sure you put coriander and you're not part of them? And I said, no, we put coriander in here. So we're gonna add some coriander in here. We're gonna add some cinnamon. What makes this Haro set really tasty is the clove. Now, if you don't like clove, um, you can use less of it. You don't have to use the amount that is recommended. Do you like clove? I don't like it when it's strong. Uh, Rich is saying simis is an Ashkenazi dish. It's, uh, and uh, Lauren says, somebody has a, a video on it. That sounds good. And I think a lot of times it has prunes. Granny says she makes hers with sweet potatoes, carrots, and prunes. It is an Ashkenazi dish, yep. And then we're gonna add ginger, ginger to this. 
if you go to the Middle Eastern store, because um, I know some of your audience is, is from California, um, so there is plenty of Middle Eastern stores. If you go to the Middle Eastern store, they actually, they actually this is actually, a new thing. They, they make it, they, make they it, have it in a pattern from Barbie to Blender to Blender is for this dish. But it's so easy to make it yourself that you really don't need to go because that's what they use. They use these four spices that I use, but they sell it in a packet and then you can just use one tablespoon of what I just did. But you don't need to. But if you if you if that will make your life easier, then by all means. All right, now we're going to add the pomegranate juice. And if I may make a suggestion, you really should make this a day before because the flavors will just start to get together even better. It's much, much tastier. And I know you don't drink, and we're gonna put manischewitz in here because it is Passover. Um, it's a Concord grape, so we are gonna put that in. And it's equal amounts of the pomegranate juice and the manischewitz. And then the rest of the manischewitz we're going to take to Aunt Giti's house so we could have the vericha. And we're also going to add a shot of red wine vinegar. So just a little bit. What about using, you know, what about using something like your pomegranate molasses in this dish if you didn't want to use the wine to get that kind of sweetness and acidity? The, the molasses is too thick. It's, it's too thick. You want something a lot lighter. So what I would do is if you don't want to use the manischewitz for this, take it out and replace it with pomegranate juice. So instead of going a cup of pomegranate and a cup of uh, manischewitz, just do two cups of pomegranate juice. It's easy enough that you can... Now comes the fun part of really mixing this together. Have you tried California balsamic pomegranate vinegar? Yes, I have. Well, you I like love it? all their products. I, I mean, haven't I, tried but you vinegars, but you love anything that's got pomegranate in it. So you know how I am with pomegranates. The way I am with sweet potatoes. That's exactly it. So now my aunt's going to say tonight, she's going to complain because I didn't make the nuts fine enough. I know her. She, she, she'll say, Grandma didn't do it like this. Grandma had the nuts even finer. But I find that I kind of like it a little chunkier um, to have it under your, when you're, you're like, you're, you're biting something into it. So this will absorb, the longer this sits, the, long, the more this will start to absorb itself and it will be literally become like a paste. Then we have our matzah and there's two or three places in the Seder service I think where you need this, right? I don't remember. Yeah. Did, did you guys, did you see the Schitt's Creek Haggadah? They I did didn't a little, see it. It's really, really funny if you're a fan of the show. It is. I've seen the show. The show is fun, but I don't remember watching the uh, watching that one. But yeah, you eat this with the matzah, and then I know you eat it with the romaine, and then you, there's a prayer for eating it with the uh, matzah, the romaine, and as a sandwich thing. I just find we eat a lot. Okay, so this is basically, and it becomes like this. And so that way you want it to be so that you could spread it, spread it evenly on your, and then what I remember grandma doing, like she used to make this a day or two ahead of time. And before she served it, she would literally either add a shot of another shot of uh, red wine vinegar or another shot of uh, manischewitz to it. 
just a little bit and she would mix it. Um, and it was just, oh, so yummy. But that's it. And then I've got another, we've got probably another 25 minutes left on the Kugel. So I'm basically done. Um, and all I'm going to do is while this is, you know, taking its form, once that's taken out the Kugel, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to put the, uh, the uh, pecan and the almonds, I'm going to put that on top of it. I'm going to lay it flat. And then I'm going to put that back in the oven for another 20 minutes. Make sure the one thing you don't want to do is to overcook the kugel because if you overcook it, then it's going to become too um, too dense and too too hard. You don't want to overcook it. And make sure you really, really, really let it cool completely before you take it out of the uh, silicone dish. Because if you like last night, we literally let it cool for about two, almost three hours, and when we wanted to take it out, it literally, we just popped it up and it just came right out. It was so easy to get it out. But if you take it out while it's still a little bit warm, you're gonna have a harder time with it. And then we kept it in the refrigerator overnight and um, that's that. Well, it looks delicious. Huh? It looks delicious. It is. So like I said, if you're looking for the recipe, please check out my YouTube video at Healthy Cooking with Shada and on my website. And that's where you can get the recipe, like AJ June said. And I hope that everybody has a Haksamea and a happy Passover. And this is wonderful. Oh, oh Lisa says, do you eat the haroset with the horseradish? There is one part of the, of the uh, ceremony where you do. Yeah, I don't like horseradish, so I, I don't. I'll eat the haro set, but I won't eat the horseradish. I'm just no. not. I'm just not a fan of horseradish. So yeah, interestingly enough, you love spicy food. So go figure. I know. Can you figure that? Makes no sense. Well, this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate you doing this, especially on a holiday. And I wish you and your family a wonderful, happy Passover and spring season and thank you so much for what you do to not only get the word healthier but to do it in an sos free way that's absolutely delicious thank you so much and thank you again for having me on your show it's been an absolute pleasure and i wish everyone out there who's celebrating passover Aksamea, happy passover to the families and a happy spring as you say spring is in the air and uh thank you for tuning tuning in on your busy holiday and thank you for your excellent taste in this beautiful birthday gift. I'm so, without so glad <laughs> you like it. So glad. I know. I miss seeing you because we could swap clothes and then we'd need half as many as we have. Exactly. I would, well, hopefully now that things are starting to settle down, I can come and see you more. Absolutely. That would be great. Thank you, Shada. And thank don't because we have three more wonderful recipes from Chef Carol Levy. She is no longer in New York. I'm sure she'll tell us where she is. So if you notice her kitchen looks differently, she's gonna be making gefilte fish, air quotes, not really fish, fish of our friends, not our food. She's gonna be making a beef horseradish and everyone's favorite, not just for Passover, but any Jewish holiday or anytime you're sick, matzo ball soup. Please welcome Chef Carol Levy. So good to see you again. Hi, AJ, it's so nice to see you. Just. Uh... Just want to make sure that I just one second. I'm just going to make sure that I'm pinned here. I, I like seeing myself here. I can do that. There we go. Perfect. Per, uh, just one second. For some reason, we're seeing Shada. And I just want to make sure that we see there. Perfect. Hi, welcome to my new home, my new kitchen. I've been on Chef AJ's show many, many times um, and which I love so much. Thank you for inviting me and to, I love sharing Passover foods. Um, I am in Taos, New Mexico living now um, in a house with a bigger kitchen, which I'm very excited about. And um, I don't wanna waste any time here because we have a lot to do. So um, the first thing I wanted to say to you when someone asked about what canadalek are, they're actually matzo balls. It's another name for matzo balls, which we are going to be making at the end. But we're going to be making first the gefilte fish. So um, this gefilte fish is made with chickpeas. And I know some of you might frown and say, oh, 
I'm not going to eat chickpeas on Passover. And as we mentioned earlier, every different form of Judaism uh, accepts different things into their dietary laws for Passover. I grew up very strict in a kosher home, Ashkenazi. So I understand uh, not eating any legumes. But in my early 20s, when I was became a vegetarian in my early 20s, I said, you know what, I'm not giving up beans. And so I have been incorporating beans and I pretend sometimes that I'm Sephardic because I, I know that they accept it and not all Sephardic accept dried beans. So everybody has different rules. So maybe some of you will frown and say, I can't make this to fill the fish. I don't eat chickpeas. Well, I'm sorry about that, but hopefully you can try it at some other time. Um, here, um, we're getting our pan hot, as I always instruct everyone to do. And a way to know the pan is hot is by putting a little water and it, putting a little flick of water. And if it starts to sizzle, which it does, it tells me immediately that the pan is hot. What I have done in advance is I have cut celery and onions and carrots and garlic. And all of this is going to go into the pan all at one time. And all we're going to do is saute that. And you might wonder, how are we sauteing without any oil? Well, the two ways that we saute when we're not using oil is with a little water or with a little broth. And I have a lot of broth that I've made today for our soup. So I have broth here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put just a teeny, teeny bit in, in this pan as it's cooking, not gonna drown it. It's very important not to drown it. You wanna just keep the moisture and we're gonna cook these things just for a very few minutes. And we are going to get that and let's just put it up a little bit hotter so that it starts to really cook. This will only need to cook for like five or six minutes. Um, again, it's pretty much equal amounts of ripe of, of onion, celery and carrots and then three large cloves of garlic. And then what we're gonna put additionally is we have one can of chickpeas, and this is a no salt chickpeas. If for some reason you're cooking your own chickpeas, which I always encourage you to do, three fourths of a cup of dried chickpeas will equal one can. So dried chickpeas will, will cook up to a cup and a half and a cup and a half of chickpeas is what you find in a can. And I've gotten the no salt, uh, so because we're watching our sodium intake here. And, not, and I try not to cook with any sugar, salt, or oil. So this is cooking very nicely. And what's gonna happen is what else we're going to put in this uh, particular recipe is we're gonna put in some lemon zest which I have taken and peeled off the lemon. It's the outer skin of the zest. We will use a half of lemon that I've already juiced here. And then we have three different uh, spices. And the spices are celery seed. Uh, they are uh, dulce granules and cayenne pepper. Okay, so those are the three things that we're putting in as far as spices. You might ask, what is dulce? I'm just going to show you that it comes in a, a little container like this. It is under the sea. It's part of kelp and it grows under the sea and it's a natural uh, uh, product for us. And it is a source of iodine actually. And a, using a little bit of it is just okay. So I don't put a, a lot in it, but this will give our chickpea gefilte fish a little fishy taste. Okay, so that comes in you can find that in your um, grocery store pretty easily, actually, it's not so hard to find. So that is that. And let's keep, get this stirring. Nothing is sticking. I just wanna show you in the pan what this looks like. Nothing is sticking. We'll just cook that for another one to two minutes. It doesn't need very long to cook at all. And what else, and we don't need any more broth. So I'm just gonna move that to the side. And we are going to get the Cuisinart here and all of these vegetables usually I let these things cool off just a little bit okay but we we're not going to have so much time to cool things off so this is going to go right into the Cuisinart okay and we didn't brown these I want to make sure that you're not trying to brown things you're just trying to lightly cook everything everything becomes very aromatic and we are gonna put that in the Cuisinart. Now, normally I would give that a very few minutes to let that cool, 
but we're not going to do that at this very second because we are trying to get everything done here. So we are going to put our lemon zest, which I already mentioned, goes in there. We're going to put our chickpeas, which are drained and rinsed, and they're going in there. Let's get rid of that. And then we're going to put our three spices that are going to go in there. Now you may ask, why do I have some celery, inner leaves of the celery? I just like showing you this because it's one of my favorite parts of the whole celery. I never throw it out. I often just, I just, I use it like parsley a lot and I tend to almost chop it up for extra celery flavor. Okay, so this is not written in my recipe at all, but I just wanna show you to never throw this part out, okay? We use the whole celery and this will, I'm just gonna add this to here just for extra celery flavor. You could also put that in your broth and make it, and again, it's a little bit of a replacement for the um, parsley. So we're just gonna step over here, not very far away from the camera. I'm using the cuisine art. And we are just gonna pulse, okay? And pulsing means that we're just, we're not putting it on, you know, continuously. We're gonna pulse it so that everything stays a nice texture, okay? So let's do that. And we're just gonna... And I usually get a spatula just to get everything down from the sides. And give this another pulse. You don't want anything to be too big into the, um, you don't want any big pieces of carrot or celery. And I cut up everything pretty small. And I can see some of it sticking on the side just a little bit. But this is pretty much there. I just, that's pretty it. That's, that's all we need to do there. And I just wanna show you that up close, what that looks like, okay? So you can put this into a bowl, either way. I'm just gonna actually, because I have the pan right here, it's just kind of a convenient thing for me to put it right into this pan. And what you're wanting to do is just shape the balls. Okay, and I form, you can get like seven, seven or eight, it just depends on the size. Um, I often, you know, everyone is heavy handed. Some people want to have a little smaller appetizer. So I usually just pat it, make sure I give it a taste, of course, before to make sure that it has the flavor that I'm looking for. It's very delicious. And always, always, before I start shaping things, I divide out all the balls, okay? Because you don't want to get a ball and then shape it, and then you get to the very end and you have just a little bit left over. So I like getting all the balls together like this, Okay, and this um, is not cooked at all. Okay, so we're going to basically refrigerate this. This is very warm right now because I just cooked those onions and I can actually feel it in my hands. Now see what I'm saying, how there's just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit left over. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Sometimes I get eight, it really depends on the size. So I'm actually gonna, because I have big one, big here, I'm gonna actually steal a little bit from here into all these, and I'm gonna make one more ball. So that way I have this. Okay, so now we have our, our, our divided even balls, and I'm just gonna rinse my hands, get them, and then I'm gonna pat them dry on a towel, yet keep them a little bit moist, okay? Just a little bit moist. And we're gonna take this plate, and we're just gonna shape these. So, you know, my grandmother, I grew up in a very strict kosher home and we made, she had to get all these different kinds of white fish and make the gefilte fish and a fish broth. And I have to say now that I'm, you know, uh, eating plant-based, that I'm so happy that the fish stay in the sea now. And um, I also make nice locks with carrots, but these are gonna be our, our gefilte fish. So I'm just going to show you one more shape just so you can see. And they kind of look like little, I don't know, it's, this is how they come out of the jar. They're little, this is how they're shaped, okay? And you just keep making those. And then ultimately you finish making those. I'm going to put the rest of these. We're not going to make them all because we have to move on, okay? But that gets all shaped. Out of here. And what happens is once you get them all shaped, you end up with a really beautiful tray. 
just want to show you what this looks like and how you could present it. And we have our built a fish on a bed of lettuce with some cooked carrots. And now we're going to make the beet horseradish that goes with that. And we'll also go with the haroset that shines. Can I just say how beautiful that looks? It looks so authentic. Nobody would know they're not eating a fish. Well, this is the crazy thing is for years and years, Chef AJ, I didn't like the, I, I did not like that the filter fish out of a jar. And I learned to make my own filter fish. And that was totally different than what comes in the jar. And now that I eat this with chickpeas, I think it's so delicious that I don't even think about fish ever. And I just love that the fish stay in the sea. So that is that. And I want to move on so that we get everything done. Um, and we are going to make the bee horseradish. Is there any questions? Because I have to um, what out the cheese in our bowl. You know, I, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I actually had a question. You know, Seder plates don't have to have the lamb shank or the egg on them anymore. You can do a vegan Seder plate, right? Oh my gosh. We do a vegan Seder when I was with Wendy in New York. Of course, we did a vegan Seder. And you you replace those traditional things. You Instead of a shank bone for the, sacrifice, for the sacrificial lamb, you would use a red beet. That would replace the bone. And, um, and then usually you have an egg on the Seder plate and that can be replaced with a number of things. That's the egg is to symbolize rebirth. And you could replace that with an avocado. Some people replace it with an eggplant. And some people just put a flower, a, a little flower right out of the garden onto the Seder plate as spring and rebirth. So I think that's very beautiful uh, both way of, of replacing those items. Do you agree, Chef AJ? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I just want to thank Angela Fischetti. Happy Pesach Super Chat donation. Thank you very much. So, another thing that my grandmother, and I know that we're all talking about every, you know, when I, for me, Jewish, cooking Jewish food is about my past and remembering my ancestors. And I learned to cook when I was nine with my grandmother. So making beet horseradish and the filter fish is something so traditional where maybe, you know, the Sephardic people would not eat necessarily the same exact things. Um, but beet horseradish was something we made as when I was a child with her all the time. And of course, she never used a machine to make any bead horseradish, but I'm gonna use the Cuisinart because it's faster. Um, when I made it with her when I was young, she would grate the horseradish. And I wanna show you what a horseradish is. This is a small one right here. It usually comes very long. It can be very wide. It looks like a carrot or a parsnip. It comes out of the ground. In fact, recently I just pulled one out of the ground at a person's house that I just met here locally. And she goes, you want a horseradish? Come to my yard and I'll pull one out of the ground for you. So we did, and it was really deep rooted. And um, it looks not so pretty, but you peel it. Okay, you peel it. And the minute that you start grating it, you start to cry. And you also get a woof up your nose. And that woof up your nose is like every piece of your sinuses has been uh, alerted and awakened. And, uh, and it also can make you cry this horseradish. And again, when I used to grate it by hand, it would be like we, we'd sit there and we'd be crying together, my grandmother and I. And that was about the bitter herbs and remembering the bittersweet time, the bitter time. So what I've done in advance, just to speed things along here, is I have cooked three beets, okay? Three whole beets. I boiled them in water. I didn't roast them. I boiled them in water. I cooked them. I peeled them. And then I grated them in the large holes of the Cuisinart. Or you could grate them by hand. Then I took the part of the horseradish. I peeled this. And I also grated it. So you can see. What I have is grated horseradish, okay? And grated beets. I did that ahead of time to speed things up. So we are now going to put all of this into the bowl of the Cuisinart. And I'm gonna get a spatula because the minute I start touching the beets, every single thing in sight becomes red. Yesterday I had red hands for the whole afternoon. Now, I thought it was funny about us talking about why we only eat horseradish once a year. 
it's like cranberries, right? We all love cranberries at Thanksgiving, but we don't make cranberries all year round. And horseradish is another red condiment that you start to think about, right? You start to think about it and say, why don't I eat this all the time? Why don't I put it on everything? Because it's so delicious, but we don't. But it's something that I, every time make it once a year, think, why am I not eating that more often? The next thing that goes in this is some kind of sweetener. Okay, so I have five medjool dates, which I have just covered early this morning in some hot water, and I'm going to take them out. They're pitted, they're soft, and five dates are going in here. Oh, and I had a half a cup of horseradish. So a half a cup of horseradish, three big beets, five dates, and there is some water here. Okay, this is sweetened water that I never throw out because it's, there's always something that needs some sweetening. So if I weren't using this today, I would just put this away in the refrigerator and definitely, definitely keep it. And then we need to have a vinegar. Now it's up to you which vinegar you choose. We need about three fourths of a cup of vinegar. And I just wanna show you that there are so many kinds of vinegars that you can use, okay? I personally like just using the white vinegar, okay? But you absolutely can use the apple cider vinegar or you can use a kind of nicer white vinegar, okay? It doesn't matter, all of them work. I think the apple would be delicious, but I'm used to a sharper flavor and I prefer this white vinegar. So we're gonna take three fourths, it's a lot, okay? Three fourths of a cup. I never put it all in at once. We're also gonna need a little black pepper, so I give this a turn. And I know that we're gonna use that water, but let's get things started on the Cuisinart. And we'll put this on. We'll set the blade, which has to fit right back down, which is hard once you have the things in it. Just a moment. I think we've got it there. That was a hard fit. And we're just going to pulse this, and this we're not going to pulse. This we're going to let get smooth as possible. And I'm going to start with the vinegar. leave a little vinegar behind, like a quarter cup, because sometimes it doesn't need all the vinegar. This is a recipe that you kind of have to learn and taste yourself, okay? Because you want it to be sharp, you want it to be a little bit sweet, you want it to be a little bit hot, and I'm just going to puree it just a little, little more. I just, just a few minutes more. And I'm gonna taste it, okay? Tasting is very important for this recipe. And it's kind of hard to, to taste it because it will be hot. It might make you cry a little bit because it's spicy. And I'm gonna taste it. And what you're trying to taste for is, does it have pepper? Can you taste the black pepper? Can Is the vinegar enough vinegar? Is it sweet enough? Is it, um, sometimes you're, you need to add a little more sweetener because maybe your beets weren't that sweet. But this actually tastes very delicious just as is. I'm gonna, I have a little, little vinegar. I'm just gonna put it into the Cuisinart. Just finish it right here. And that is it. I just wanna show you how beautiful that is, okay? How red, delicious it is. Spicy, okay? I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, it is spicy. If you are afraid to eat such spicy, just cut back your horseradish, okay? And also, you don't have to put a big dollop on your plate either, right? So let's just get this. I usually like to get this out into, let me get the spatula. You can put it into a bowl, so get it out of the Cuisinart. It's a lot, this makes a lot. 
But like I said, it goes on to everything. If I, if it were up to me, it would go on to everything. When I was married, my husband would put it literally on every single thing he ate. And he wasn't even Jewish, but he loved it so much that he put it on a sandwich. He would put it in his breakfast. He'd eat it all the time. And I'd say- It's like, it's like the Jewish version of hot sauce. It is the Jewish version of hot sauce. And honestly, it's something that I have always loved making. And you know, I wanted to have like a lemonade stand, only my stand was gonna be horseradish stand because I think it's so delicious. Just wanna show you what that looks like, okay? And again, the Cuisinart just is done. Um, I often will put it into jars like this. I just wanna show everyone. I put it into jars and I love giving it away as little gifts. Okay, so that is something that I do often. And of course, of course, you know, what you would do during the Seder is we represent, we put the haroset on the matzah, which is the sweetness. And then we put a layer of the horseradish, which is the bitter herbs. And then you put another layer of matzah and that sandwich is like my favorite sandwich for the next seven or eight days because it's so delicious. It's sweet and spicy at the same time. This is oat matzah. I just wanna show you, it's something that I really like. I get this special oat matzah, which is gluten-free and it's quite delicious and it's all handmade and it's got these nice little burnt edges. But that I would go in here. Girl, I've never seen, I've tasted gluten-free matzah homemade, but I've never seen oat matzah. Where did you get it? Well, first of all, I will tell you that, you know, I'm spoiled when I was in New York, I learned about it at Zabar's, okay? But now that I'm in the Southwest and I, there were plenty of matzahs here, believe it or not. I even found gluten. I found gluten-free matzah in the regular grocery store, but to my surprise, it had eggs in it. It had palm oil in it. It had um, honey in it. So that wasn't good, you know? So I just ordered it on Amazon. I literally ordered it on Monday and got it by Thursday. So it's um, quite great and it's oat matzah and it's delicious. Sometimes I make my own oat matzah actually with just mixing oat flour and water and rolling it out and then cooking it in a really hot oven. It, it's just flour and water. It doesn't need to be anything else. So I'm just showing you that this is the beautiful matzah and then the jars of horseradish. What is the brand that you had, if I may ask? Well, I could show it to you closer up so you can just see it. It is not cheap, okay? So I just want to tell you this one little box, one little box is $38, which is highway robbery for flour and water, okay? But they know that we all need it and they know that we want it and they can charge anything they want for it. But what is lovely is, is that it's the Shimura matzah, which is really handmade, which is really an incredible, if you've ever um, had the uh, opportunity, which I have in Brooklyn when I was in New York, to watch them make the Shimura matzah, which is just incredible because it has to be made within a record amount of time from the time the flour and the water gets mixed the time that they're rolling it out to the time that it gets perforated and then goes into the oven, comes out of the oven. Um, I believe it uh, has to be done, I think in seven minutes. Uh, it might be wrong, it might be eight, but it has to be done within a very short amount of time. So it's like good balsamic vinegar, um, AJ. You know, there's balsamic and then there's real balsamic, right? And so I always feel like the really good matzah is the really good matzah, but you pay for it. Um, wow. Any that. questions? I didn't know we would talk about matzah so much, but it's a good lesson. Well, maybe maybe if we do this next year, you can actually make matzah on the show. That would be fun. Yeah, it is pretty fun. And like I said, it's just meant to be flour and water. That's all they had. I, I'm not sure how other ingredients get worked into there. And that's why I like to reiterate to everyone how important it is to read labels when you're buying things. Because you think, oh, this is what should be just so simple. But yet they somehow have managed to work in five or six ingredients that maybe you don't necessarily want to have. So the next thing that we're doing, and again, I'm just trying to be conscientious. We are really right at time, right this very minute, um, is that I want to make matzo balls. And the matzo balls. Okay. 
Car- Carol, don't don't rush. You, I can go another fifteen minutes, please. Yes. I don't want you to. Okay, and thank you so much, AJ. So we're gonna make, we're gonna make the uh, matzo balls. And when I went from being a vegetarian to being a vegan, and I really was like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen to my Jewish past? What's gonna happen in my history of cooking on the holiday? How am I going? Jewish food is primarily made with fat, sugar, and eggs. And when I became a vegan, I immediately started trying to work up recipes and trying to figure out how do I make the challah? How do I make the challah without the eggs and the oil and the sugar? Which has taken me time, but I have figured it out. So here are what we call the matzo balls, and they're often called kanedach. And um, I'm making these with quinoa flakes, okay? Quinoa flakes are not what we know as quinoa. Quinoa is like little tiny seeds. The quinoa flakes is, this is a brand that I actually got in New York, but I just wanna show you really close. I don't necessarily wanna show you the brand, but I just wanna show you that they're flakes. What would I say they're equivalent to? They look like instant oatmeal, okay? That's what they look like. Where are you going to find them? It might be a hard find, might be. Um, It just depends where you are. I think you could get them at any health food store. I think that you could also get them at your regular grocery store, but they might be in the cereal aisle. They might consider, I know Ancient Harvest, the brand Ancient Harvest makes quinoa flakes. So what we're gonna do is we have a cup, uh, we have, let me just look, we have a cup and a cup of the quinoa flakes. And then I usually use a half a cup of the matzo meal. But if you are gluten-free and you don't want to use the matzo meal, you can just add another half of a cup of the quinoa flakes. So it means you would have a total of cup and a half of quinoa flakes. What I have done, I'm doing a little experiment because I've made so many of these. I thought while we're talking and doing, I actually ground up a little of the oat matzah earlier today and made a half a cup of matzo meal, which was out of the oat matzah. And I'm using that in here today. So this is what we have. We have our oats and we have our some kind of matzo meal or all oats. And then we're gonna put in some raw onion, okay? Not cooked onion. I have chopped it very fine. And it's a, it is two tablespoons of finely chopped onion, okay? That is what is going to go in there. And I'm going to, See if we can get this. So, and also what goes in is some parsley. Okay, and how much parsley? Two tablespoons. Um, I have a big, I don't usually measure these things, but I have a measuring. This is actually a measuring spoon of two tablespoons. I cut up a lot of parsley earlier. So that's going in. And when I put things into a bowl, I just want to tell you, I put them in in different spots, okay? I don't just plop everything all on top of each other because as you know when we're in the kitchen we get interrupted either by our kids or by a phone call or something interrupts us and you step away and then you don't know exactly where you are if i make little piles of things then i have a sense of exactly what i put in okay so we have our onions we have our parsley and we're going to have three different kinds of spices And I have a half a teaspoon of ground ginger. I have a quarter teaspoon of fresh nutmeg. And then I have one fourth of a teaspoon of paprika. Okay, so paprika, ginger, and nutmeg. That's going in there. Okay, and then I have a half a cup of broth that is from uh, broth that I made. And the secret here is everything has to get bonded together. There are no eggs. So what I've done is I have pureed in the Cuisinart. I'm just gonna show this up to you close. And I have taken the tofu. Okay, this is tofu here. Just wanna show you, I'm using this brand called Mori Nu, which is really commonly found in supermarkets. Um, in, it's sometimes refrigerated, but sometimes not. I've never quite understood why some stores put it in the refrigeration, other people just have it on the shelf. When you bring it home, it doesn't need refrigeration. It has a little water in it, 
So you want to make sure you drain the water. And then I just put it into the Cuisinart or into a blender and you literally just puree it, right? You just puree it and you get this beautiful, it looks like pudding, honestly. Uh, and any of you that make dressings and, and we all know that we can make cheese and various things out of to different forms of tofu. So this tofu is gonna go inside this bowl, just like this, all of the whole package, okay? The whole package is going in here. And we're gonna get this mixed up. And I'm going to just, I wanna see if I can, just show you, I'm gonna get a little pot on the stove here very quickly. Doing this spontaneously. I wasn't planning on doing it like this, but let's just see if we can get that water to boil in the time that we have. So this gets mixed up, okay? This gets mixed up like this. Now, even when I used to make matzo balls, uh, there is tricks to matzo balls. And even if you're making it with the normal way when you make it with eggs, which we are not doing, the key, and everybody, if you talk to anybody's aunt or mother, they'll say, oh, we put bicarbonate of soda in it. That's what makes them so fluffy. Or we put this in it and we put, everybody has their own little secret on how to make them fluffy. And it's almost like, when you're at the table, you're judging the host sometimes by how fluffy their canado are. And um, the key to it is putting it in the refrigerator, okay? So the longer you let it sit, the better, the harder, the everything absorbs, uh, whether it's you're making it with the matzo meal or the, in the quinoa, everything has to absorb. And the longer you have it sit, the better. So the minimum amount of time, I would say, would be an hour. The, the ideal length of time, I would say overnight. So this is the way that it looks. It looks very hard, okay? Very, very hard. I'm going to give it a little bit of taste to make sure that it does taste good, okay? If for some reason you were missing the salt, because matzo balls can be very salty, I would put a little lemon zest. You could use some coconut aminos. You could use some tamari if you wanted to put a little, little bit of kick in there because you think, oh, I'm missing the salt, okay? So that's what this goes. And this then goes into the refrigerator. So I'm gonna put this away for this moment. And I'm gonna show you right here, taking it out of the refrigerator, okay? And what you have after you've taken it out of the refrigerator is very cold, very, very cold, okay? And I take a scoop. Now, you don't have to have a scoop. You can do it however you'd like, but I always wet my hands, just like when we were forming the um, uh, gefilte fish, you wanna have semi-wet hands, not really wet hands. So my trick to that always is, what do you do? You kind of pat your hands, but they're kind of wet. You know, they're a little bit wet. And we are going to get a little plate here. And I just scoop these out, okay? This is a number 40 scoop. I use it all the time for various things. Just makes it even, fast, right? And I scoop everything, just, I usually scoop. Now, you don't have to make the whole batch at one time. You could just make, like for me, I'm a single person, I'm not gonna eat 12 matzo balls at one time. So I would maybe just cook four matzo balls today and then tomorrow or the next day when I want to have more fresh matzo balls, I will just make the rest of them. Okay, it's up to you if you cook them all in advance or you cook up to you at a time. Okay, so I'm not gonna continue to scoop. I just want you to see. And then what happens is you roll. <clears throat> I seem to have gotten something in my throat, probably the matzah. And you just roll, okay? And you get all these balls. And before you even start rolling, what you would do, and I'm not gonna do it all for you today because we're time limited on time, but you get a pot of water onto the stove and you put a lid on it and you get the water to boil. And when the water starts to boil, you take the lid off and you put in your matzo balls. 
each one at a time. You try to space them far apart so they're not ever sitting on each of each other. You wanna make sure that they have their own little swimming area. And then the second tip, again, we want the first tip was putting it in the refrigerator and letting it get chilled. The second tip is once you get them into the boiling water, you put the lid on and then you don't lift that lid for another 40 minutes. Because if you go in there and peek at the matzo balls, the minute you let that steam out, those matzo balls are gonna fall to the bottom. And you want them to continue cooking and what makes them light and fluffy is they will slowly start to elevate themselves up to the top of the pot. And the, and the light is on simmer and you don't look at anything for 40 minutes, okay? 40 minutes. I'm gonna just rinse this, just gonna, show you just really quickly i think this water here is already boiling on the on this burner we again don't have time to cook this okay but i'm just going to show you that you could cook two at a time right they would just go in this pot like that and they would go in here see i just want to show you that they're going to go in there like that we're just going to cook two and then this lid would go on here for 40 minutes and that never gets looked at again for an entire 40 minutes. And it sits on simmer, okay, simmer, not boiling anymore, just simmer. So what we're gonna do, I know we have to finish, and I'm just going to show you our finished product. Um, I will show you here earlier today. It's, um, this is where I have the matzo balls. They're all in here floating. They've been in here for a couple hours. They can stay like this. So what you would do is you would also have some broth. And I want to point out to you that I make my own broth all the time. And it's something for you to consider. If you are cutting up just this morning, prepping for today's show, I ended up with onion skins, onion ends, celery, carrots. I had some tomatoes. I had um, some leeks that were left over in the fridge and I made a whole pot of broth. And I just wanna show you that you can make your own broth without having to buy it in the store. Okay, so what happens is we'll get the bowl. I'm gonna get two uh, matzo balls out from the, from the back here. Gonna put them in my soup. Okay. And then I'm going to get some broth. This is really good. I've already, I have some carrots and some onions. Just gonna pour this on like this, trying to get, drain the vegetables. Okay, that is our broth. And I'm gonna move this away. And then what would be uh, chicken, ch matzo balls with broth if you didn't put some fresh dill? Okay, and that's really what finishes this soup off is having the fresh dill, okay? And I know that sometimes dill comes in a gigantic bunch at the store and often I can't even, I usually would split it with a friend. I would say, hey, I bought a bunch of dill. Do you want some dill? I have a ton of it. But I try to buy it when I'm at the store in these little teeny packages. And that way I don't waste any of it and I just have the right amount of dill. But you really do want that dill because that is what makes this so very special, okay? And that is, I'm gonna move some of all of these things so we can finish up. AJ, I don't know if you have any questions in the chat, but I just wanna finish by showing you all the things that we've made. We have the matzo balls, technically we have the matzo balls with the broth and the carrots and the potatoes. And then we have the, beet horseradish, and then of course we would put a little bit, not a lot, but I don't, just a dollop, you would take a little bit of this and you would put it right in the middle and, and show it on the gefilte fish like that. You know, when I was little, we used to call it filthy fish. <laughs> and it probably was filthy fish actually. Yeah. So Lola says, can you please mention what is binding this together? Binding which together because we made two things that are like dumplings and they're both bound differently. I'm guessing it's the matzo ball because it's a recent post. Okay, so the matzo ball is bound together with 
tofu, silken tofu that we've pureed and so that it's creamy and that's what's binding it together. Right, and Denise said, do you boil the matzo balls in the soup or in boiling water? I actually like personally always to boil them in just clean water because you can boil them into the soup broth, but sometimes all the little particles kind of pollute the broth. And I like to have them clear in the water and then put them into the soup because often when you cook them in the soup, it changes the color of the matzo ball and makes it a little brownish. And I like them to look whitish. And then I can show you, I just wanna show you because no one's gonna believe this, to see, you have to see and if you can see close up, whoops, I just dropped it, but how fluffy that is. Really, really fluffy. And really delicious. Yeah, I remember my aunt, her, her, her matzo balls were like, like lead. They were like golf balls. Nobody wanted to eat them. They were so heavy. I'm telling you, you often judge a host sometimes by how well their matzo balls, if they're light and fluffy. These are definitely not the AV kind that maybe you've grown up with. But again, if you're, we're not, I'm not eating eggs. Um, we are promoting a vegan uh, lifestyle here. And so this is a delicious substitute uh, and, and a clever way of making fluffy matzo balls. Wow, it's incredible. Have you ever made a, a plant-based SOS free rugula? Um, I have not tackled rugula yet, but I just tackled a really delicious chala made with, um, with sweet potatoes and, um, and really lovely fla and flour that has a mixture of different kinds of flour. And it took me a little bit of time. It takes time to figure these things out because we want them to be tasting like what we have as a memory, a childhood memory, but we also have to understand that it's a different product, right? So we have to accept that it's brand something, maybe it's not exactly the AV collar that we grew up with, but it's a very delicious collar. So um, I haven't made rugula, but that's a good idea, AJ. I like that one. I have to and try. I'm sure that that is easy, easy, easy thing actually, now that I think about it. Because I make a very good pie dough and you would just make the same kind of dough and then you would roll the nuts and the, and the dates inside and make the little snails. And yeah, that would be incredible. Or even an apple strudel. Oh my gosh. You are just in dessert heaven at the moment. <laughs> uh, when are you going to write a book already? Your recipes are so extraordinary and so unique. I don't, I, you know what? It's taken me time. You know, I'm one of those cooks that have always just cooked and I worked in restaurants for years and I also have cooked for friends for so long that just writing things down sometimes is a chore for me. And, and what has happened over this past year as I've been doing demos is it's forced me to explain and forced me to write the amounts down. So maybe a book will for come at some point, but it's, um, it's a discipline. It's a discipline to write things down when you're just cooking and enjoying yourself. But I do want to share with everyone and I want to empower people to make, you know, delicious, healthy food. And I want to thank you so much for inviting me on the holiday to share with all of everyone. And um, my, these particular recipes are not posted yet on my website, but I will try to get them up there as soon as possible so that everyone can have something in hand. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much. You did a great job. I always love having you on the show. These recipes look amazing. Thank you so much, Carol. You're welcome. And thank you. And Chag Sameach. And have a good holiday. And anyone that's not observing Passover but is tuning in, just happy Easter next Sunday, I believe. So even, happy spring. And even if you only did one recipe, Dayenu. Dayenu is right. <laughs> It would have been enough. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for tuning in, especially on the holiday. Hope you have a very happy Passover if you celebrate. And even if you don't, try these recipes. They're absolutely delicious. And if you love delicious recipes, please come back tomorrow at the regular time of 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guest is another amazing plant-based chef, this one from Colorado, Kelly Williamson. She's been on the show before and she is going to be making her plant-based version of a gyro with tzatziki sauce, I hope I said that correct, and a Greek cucumber noodle salad. Chag Sameach, Carol, and everyone. Thank Take care. Thank you so much, and thank you, Shida, for cooking with me as well. And I made Persian harosa too, so 
we're all together here and enjoying Seder uh, in, in our internet way. 